Uh, I'm Patrick Holden, I'm director of the Soul Association. Patrick, it's fantastic to find you in Copenhagen. What are you doing here? Well, I'm here at the Climate Forum gathering, um, and this morning we've had a workshop panel discussion about the role of organic farming and sustainable agriculture in addressing climate change. And uh, I've just actually, it's just ended, and it's been very inspirational because we had uh, Vandana Shiva there, and we had an amazing woman called Barbara Banda, who's from Zambia, who's, I think, you know, an emerging Vandana Shiva because she's only 26 years old and she's running a women's project which is really transforming the livelihoods of women uh, in an agrarian part of Zambia based on sustainable agriculture. Uh, and I was just saying in this session that actually probably the inspiration and the influence that we need for 21st century sustainable farming systems will come from women and uh, because they have a combination of qualities which I think, think reflects the change of the zeitgeist that is going on actually here in Copenhagen which is away from top down towards bottom up which is about I can be the change which is by my personal actions on the land I can be part of the future, uh, not just wait for the COP15 either to reach the right conclusions or not. Yeah. I've been hearing lots of words here at um, Copenhagen. I haven't heard enough of the word organic. How does organic work into the whole Copenhagen Treaty? Very interesting question. The role of agriculture, and particularly sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, because those of us that are here representing that movement have been working for 30 years to develop a new model of an agricultural system which minimizes the use of non-renewable external inputs, which is addressing the environment, biodiversity, animal welfare, social and cultural issues, and which recently has been looking at resilience and relocalizing production systems. And yet, really, it's not on the agenda. Why? Very interesting question. I think that the old model of top-down thinking, input-dependent agriculture, another second green revolution which will involve genetic engineering and yet more chemical inputs which of course are running out and which in any case contribute towards climate change is still the predominant way of thinking about uh, around the governments represented here and because of that there's a private wish that actually agriculture will somehow be exempted from the emission reduction targets. And that's why even here in the EU, um, governments do not have mandatory targets for emission reductions in agriculture. And I think that's against the background. You know, we've got to feed 9 billion people. We've got to intensify further if we're going to achieve that. Therefore, we're going to have to have more um, greenhouse gas emitting uh, farming systems. And therefore, actually, we don't know what to do. So what we were doing at this workshop was exploring the role of sustainable organic farming in reinstating nature's carbon bank, the soil. The soil has been depleted uh, over the last 150 years because of intensive agriculture. And in fact, 10% of all the gases currently um, in the atmosphere come from release from the soil bank. And what we have found is that if we change the whole of the world's agriculture to sustainable agriculture based on organic principles, we can re-lock up some of that CO2 that's currently in the atmosphere, thereby making a substantial contribution towards addressing climate change. Isn't that exciting? That is so exciting. It's extremely exciting because we've been then talking to indigenous people here at Climate Forum, hearing how actually climate change is already affecting them and how they want to be able to talk about their cultures, their landscapes, how they farm. And it seems very sustainable and organic practices they have. And so I think it's really important that sustainable and organic farming to be addressed here at this treaty. How do we get it onto the treaty, Pat? I think we can get it onto the treaty in new ways, the old way of top-down change, waiting for our great leaders to legislate. I'm not saying they don't have to legislate, and let's hope they will, but the truth is that there's been a sort of shift in the zeitgeist, and I think you can feel it here. And the solution now is bottom-up. It's about what action can I take, shocked by the urgency of the need for change, which nevertheless I can take independent of whether our leaders reach the right conclusions, and which can be better and more life-affirming and increase the quality of life for me and my family. And I think the interesting thing is that this is about selfish action, 
which at the same time is good for the wider environment. One of the problems, I think, of the debate about climate change is it's been based on all the wrong triggers. You know, it's been about, this is a huge thing, we're all going to fry by 2050 unless a lot of action is taken. It probably won't happen because of the politics. And meanwhile, I just feel guilty and disempowered. Whereas this movement for sustainable agriculture is based on, I want to do something which is good for me, which is good for my family, which is good for my community, which I can do now immediately, which will immediately start doing good. And actually, I feel inspired as well as empowered. And I think that this is a big idea, and it's almost like we've been surfers in the organic movement, waiting for 30 years to, for the wave to come in. And the wave is the right conditions when somehow intuitively there's a thirst for this kind of solution. It's out there, and now suddenly other conditions are right. I know that we're being positive here, yeah, yeah. but let's not underestimate the, the challenge and the scale of the challenge that we've got in front yeah, of us absolutely. if we're going to let's enable this to happen, because this has got to be on a very large scale, very quick. Mm -hmm.